Cowboy Bebop is transcendental. It's obsessed with the power of letting go, moving on to another plane of existence, surpassing one's fears by accepting one's vulnerabilities, rather than overcoming them. It's fitting, then, that Bebop itself transcended a cultural roadblock and brought anime to the West for so many would-be fans. Anime had, of course, existed in the West prior to Bebop's 2001 run on Adult Swim, but it signalled a shift in mainstream appreciation, in understanding, perhaps, for the Japanese cartoon. Upon finishing the series for the first time and watching Misty-Eyed, that last long pan into the stratosphere that Bebop had called home for the 26 episodes prior, it's impossible not to feel transported, not just to a dilapidated sci-fi future, mind you, but a different state of mind altogether. In the 20 years since its debut, Cowboy Bebop's approach to entertainment, philosophy and life hasn't grown stale. Taking a trip with the crew of the Bebop feels just as wonderfully bittersweet today as it did so many trips ago. And even as you're appreciating just how perfect a run it is, it's hard not to wish for another bounty, another fistful of wulongs, in such fine company. And so I invite you once again to buckle up and join me as I explore the universe of Cowboy Bebop and the enduring, endearing adventures of Jet Black, Faye Valentine, Edward Wong Howe Pepperloo Tevrosky IV, and Spike Spiegel. And Ein, a genetically modified corgi. Okay? Three, two, one, it's jam. Last year celebrated the 20th anniversary of Cowboy Bebop, a show that many still cite as the greatest anime of all time, and it isn't hard to see why. With a self-contained run of 26 episodes that leaves little unresolved by the time the curtain falls, and a killer accompanying motion picture, Cowboy Bebop represents a rare treat in anime. Completion. With a cast of rogues that are lovingly written and fascinatingly explored, an enticing universe to discover with them, and an incredible soundtrack scoring every exciting, hilarious and thought-provoking escapade, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this ensemble was destined for success from the get-go. But the reality couldn't be further from the truth. Cowboy Bebop had to claw and scrap just to see the light of day, and in doing so earn itself and its creators a place in the history books. What's much like the jazz stylings of its soundtrack, Cowboy Bebop represents a coming together of talent building towards a beautiful whole. Talent from across the globe contributing to one voice. The loudest of them all is Shinichiro Watanabe. Today he's a household name in Japan, having directed beloved titles such as Samurai Champloo, Kids on the Slope and Space Dandy. Well, this is something different. But it was with 1998's Cowboy Bebop that he made his directorial debut. Much like the cartoons of the West designed explicitly to sell action figures, Bebop was pitched as a way to put expensive toy spaceships in Japanese homes. Toy company Bandai gave Watanabe the simple brief of, so long as there's a spaceship in it, you can do whatever you want. Under different leadership, Cowboy Bebop would have been a remarkably different beast. But Watanabe used this freedom to craft an anime quite unlike anything the world had ever seen. Watanabe ditched the teenage audience Bandai had no doubt envisioned, and crafted instead a show that appealed almost exclusively to more mature viewers. After seeing the first few episodes, however, Bandai were left understandably concerned with their investment, and the toys they could market off the back of it. The ships Watanabe and company had presented here were barely fit for flight in Bebop's universe, let alone model kits and high-end replicas in our own. The Bebop itself was a jerry-rigged fishing boat, and the personal zip crafts of the crew were equally beaten up and falling apart. Cowboy Bebop refused to glorify these machines. 
They were constantly breaking down, getting bested in dogfights, and looked as if they'd taken one too many chips through hyperspace. Worried about dumping any more money into what they saw as a dead end, Bandai pulled out. And for a while, it looked like Cowboy Bebop and its beautifully decrepit ships were destined never to leave the hangar. Until, that is, sister company Bandai Visual unexpectedly picked up the show, and Watanabe got back to work, now with even more freedom than before. It's a situation that happens rarely in anime production, even less so for a director with no experience under their belt, but Watanabe didn't squander the opportunity. Rallying the crew with promises that this show would still be talked about decades later, the team delivered a product quite unlike anything that had come before, and, well, here we are, talking about Cowboy Bebop decades later. Sadly for everyone involved, Bebop's production hell didn't stop there. During its initial run in the summer of 1998, concerns were raised about Cowboy Bebop and its scenes of violence and lawlessness. Japan itself was suffering from an increase in crime at the time, and the call was made to air only half of the 26 episodes, leading to a special goodbye episode that prematurely bookended Bebop's maiden voyage. The always erudite Watanabe closed the episode with the following title card. This is not the end. You will see the real Cowboy Bebop someday. True to his word, Bebop wasted no time flying back to screens at the end of the year, in its uncensored glory and later crossed the Pacific Ocean to bring America, one of its most enduring seasons of anime to date. The, the show, uh, to me, Watanabe, really, after a while, it was, it was such a love letter to the film industry and the music industry and great jazz and great science fiction. And it's all spaghetti. I mean, the whole thing is based on science fiction spaghetti western. To me, the world itself is, is not so much about going to the different planets, but it's, it's about going from like one genre to the next and, and, and of movies and incorporating it into this world that he had established. The West embraced Cowboy Bebop as if it had always been theirs. Their love for the show rivaled Japan's own, and this is thanks to a number of factors. Firstly, Watanabe had infused Bebop with a Western spirit from the off. The show proudly wore its spaghetti Western and sci-fi roots on its sleeve, and constantly sent up the pop culture of the West. It's a genre that Watanabe would go on to further populate with the likes of Samurai Champloo, another genre-bending celebration of Western styles and influences. As Bebop effortlessly blended genres episode to episode, it paid homage to classics such as Alien, Desperado, Bonnie and Clyde, Star Trek, and black exploitation cinema. Its soundtrack was a heady mix of jazz, funk, soul, and surf, and its episodic format meant that you could catch an errant episode and feel completely in the loop. But the biggest win for Bebop in America was its wonderful localization. So it was a rat, right? I mean, this is no big deal, am I wrong? I have no clue. You got some kind of poison that's not in the database. I'm checking into some similar toxins. Cryptopolysium, no, that's not it. Cholera? Mm -hmm. Nah, it's not that. Mm. Ebola virus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nope. So what could it be then? Well, it's, uh... Ed leaps down from out of nowhere. A mystery space creature! <laughs> Anime dubs have a legacy that's hard to shake. A history of poor adaptations that have sent many fans to religiously seek out subtitles, rather than endure the alternative. Because there's just that chemistry, and that's, that's that kind of alchemic uh, combination that is so rare. And one of the great things that made this show stand out, I think, is as a dub, when dubs weren't acceptable. Bebop confidently bucked that trend, with a talented, warm, professional cast and direction that understood the philosophical nature of the show, little was lost in the move to the English language, and even today, 
In an age where original voice tracks and subtitles are easier to get hold of than ever, many fans still swear by Bebop's dub, refusing to watch it any other way. It's a huge reason that the show quickly became a staple of televised anime, and it's been broadcast nearly every year following its debut. Which is a fantastic thing. Bebop, more than most, rewards repeat viewings. Not only in the multitude of easter eggs to catch, the heavy foreshadowing throughout, and the story beats that carry so much more weight after learning the crew's backstories, but in its comfortable, consumable nature. At its core, Cowboy Bebop is about belonging, and when it unceremoniously ends, you feel a little out of place, like you just lost a family of sorts. It only makes sense, then, to go back to the beginning and feel at home once more. And, and that's what makes you want to watch it again from the beginning, because you want that character again, and you want, you want to see them all again. There's a growing appreciation each time you digest Cowboy Bebop, whether it's a favourite episode in a vacuum, for me it's Toys in the Attic, or whether you decide to run through the entire thing all over again and revel in its pitch-perfect balance. For every deafening dogfight, there's a moment of quiet introspection. For every scene of Ed mischievously tearing through the ship, there's a pause for philosophical musings. For each stupendously silly caper, there's a strong reminder of one's own mortality. Cowboy Bebop outwardly grins, carefree, and promises endless zero-G escapades, but its stakes are anything but floaty. It's perfectly content to end an episode with a melancholic bummer, and in doing so, it elevates itself above its contemporaries in a grounded way. This balance extends to the broken leads of Cowboy Bebop. At first brush, you might think you have them figured out. The grouch, the basket case, the pin-up, and the infinitely cool cowboy. But they grow out of these stereotypes almost instantly. Each member of the Bebop are walking vulnerabilities wrapped up in defense mechanisms whether that be their machismo, or sexuality, or even their wackiness. And part of Bebop's enduring appeal is watching those layers fall away to reveal something uncomfortably raw and naked. They also reject the typical camaraderie such shows trade in. The crew is made up of people mercenary enough to earn that title, who put themselves first, the cash reward second, and everything else a distant third place when it comes to priorities. They don't rush to each other's aid, instead often choosing to outright ditch them. I kind of got myself caught. What? Either you show up at the place they specify, or my life is over. You brought this on yourself, so deal with it yourself. We're busy. But despite this, there's a redemption for the Bebop, who begrudgingly become a broken family. And it's through these hard-earned relationships where Bebop finds its weight. A cacophony of clashing voices, working in both harmony and dissonance. They can't exist alone, and yet, they can barely coexist. As we watch them weave, loud and reckless, in and out of each other's lives, we're reminded of something. One of the many keys to Bebop's enduring success is the stunning score. Its snarling jazz soundtrack was, if you'll excuse the pun, instrumental in thematically grounding the series, and lends it an erratic tempo and ensemble atmosphere. This is largely the work of composer Yoko Kano, who formed the project band Seatbelts and scored the entire season of Cowboy Bebop with an astonishing versatility and range. The completion of this project predates the finalisation of much of Cowboy Bebop's key characters and plots, meaning that the upbeat, wild music of the seatbelts likely affected the direction of the series, which can be felt throughout. Like the show and its love of breaking genre conventions, Kano's adaptive score is wonderfully eclectic and varied, bouncing erratically between the improvisational Bebop style of jazz and a whole host of other influences. And it's here that the intentions of Kano and Watanabe intersect, never more so apparent than in Bebop's ferocious opening. As Kano's attention-grabbing tank wails in the background, Watanabe's atypical style paints a vibrant picture of the world and the people of Bebop. And behind it all is a seemingly shared manifesto, for both the show and its score, that they will play freely, without fear of risky things, that they'll create new dreams by breaking traditional styles, and the work that will become a new genre itself will be called
And after all that, after fighting for its right to exist time and time again, after beating the odds, the censors, the curse of dubbed anime, and after crafting one of the finest animated shows in the history of the medium, Cowboy Bebop bowed out, on its own terms, after a single season. With certainty and resolution, the curtains closed on Spike Spiegel and the gang of the Bebop. Or so we thought. A few years after Bebop hit our television sets and left us desperate for more, Watanabe delivered one final adventure for our favourite space cowboys. Dripping with style and packed with blisteringly cool fight scenes, Knocking on Heaven's Door debuted on the big screen. Working, once again, as a completely standalone adventure, not carrying on from the series finale but instead squeezing into existence right in the middle of it, the movie gave a welcome encore and a fitting final send-off to the crew of the Bebop. But it just as happily serves as an introduction, or a mid-season break. Much like its jazz roots, that's the beauty of Cowboy Bebop. It can be performed and consumed any which way. He called you a cowboy. What did he mean? What are you? Just a humble bounty hunter, ma'am. Bebop will likely be enjoyed long after Watanabe's original prediction. It's the result of a true ensemble of talent, and a bit of luck getting them all together. Watching and listening to the beating jazz heart of Cowboy Bebop, you have to appreciate that the stars kind of aligned with this one. Taking a critical eye to Bebop is to miss the point entirely. Indeed, nothing about the show, from its tumultuous road to release, to its broken, beat up, beautifully human crew, should have worked. But somehow, Watching Cowboy Bebop feels like belonging. There's something intangible to its magic. And like lightning, I think that's why people can't see it striking twice with news of the impending live action adaptation. Even though there's a perfectly good blueprint on how to do it out there in the verse. At last, we can retire and give up this life of crime. But Adult Swim have had it right this whole time with their annual broadcast. Bebop is worth revisiting. It deserves your continued attention, your evolving ruminations and a shifting approach to its multifaceted storytelling. When you return to Bebop, the battered ships have earned their scars, as have the troubled people piloting them. And as the credits crawl on yet another trip to the stars with our favorite group of weirdos, we're left with a reassuring permeance in four little words. No matter what, Cowboy Bebop will always be there for us. So, until you return once again to the comforting weight of Bebop. Life is just a dream, you know, that's never ending. I'm ascending. As always, thanks for watching. Bebop was so much fun to talk about, so you'll have to excuse me for going on quite as long as I did. I hope you enjoyed watching this deep dive as much as I did putting it together. My next major project just got funded by the lovely folks over at Patreon and is looking like it will be another mammoth undertaking, an exploration of all things berserk. I'll put out a couple of shorter videos in the run up to that release to keep the channel alive, but fear not, Guts and the gang are coming in traditionally bloody fashion. If you want to fund future projects like this, head over to the Patreon. We're well on our way to funding a video about Evangelion, and you can join a really friendly community of folks who disagree with almost everything I say. If, instead, you want to join a community of people who blindly agree with me, and never call me names for having liked fireworks, hit the like button, and together we can build that community.